Welcome back to the Lisa Wexler Show. I got to tell you today, we're talking about women in power. You know, this is what makes me tick. This is what makes me alive. The idea and the power and the passion behind giving women and supporting other women so that they can be the best they can be, so they can be free and full and live lives that have all the civil rights that are accorded to men and have all the choices that have always been accorded to men. This is what's important in the world. We cannot be the most that we can be as a world, as a planet, if half of our population is under the thumb, if half of our population can only show their eyes when they go out in public, they can't drive, they can't decide who they're going to marry, when they're going to marry, how many children they're going to have. Can they get a divorce? Can they own a house? Can they go to university? Can they become a doctor? We cannot have the world that we want to have if women are kept out of it. And the Arab world for too long has kept too many women out of it. And I was so cheered and so happy and am so happy to hear that the Egyptian women are on their feet and they're not going to take it anymore. But it can't be just a flash in the pan. It's going to have to be something that is part and parcel of a movement for meaningful change. I asked Gloria Fell to join me today because Gloria is a woman who has been on the barricades for her entire life. She's not only a public speaker and a lecturer. In fact, she lectures right now at a course called Women, Power, and Leadership at Arizona State University. She's a best-selling author and the former president and CEO of Planned Parenthood Federation of America. Welcome back to the show, Gloria Fell. Thank you, Lisa. I'm so happy to be here with you, as always. You have a great show. Well, thank you so much. So, Gloria, tell me, because I really want to know how this passion, this energy, this I'm not going to take it anymore and I'm not going to stand for women being stripped and beaten by military. How does that translate into a movement? We just heard from a gal. I don't know if you heard the segment, but a woman called in from Washington, D.C., someone I did not know, who was apparently, she and her sister are Egyptian. Her sister's already back there. They've been sleeping in Tahrir Square. They're doing their thing as people who straddle you know, the modern world and the Egyptian world and really are progressive in terms of their interests. And what she said, which was startling to me, was that the backlash against the very severe Islamists has actually led to a backlash against women's rights. In other words, she's saying if we had a moderate approach towards the Muslim Brotherhood, we would get along with them better. But by pushing Islam out, the, the Salafi movement gained power it didn't need to gain. Now, that's all political mumbo-jumbo in Egypt. I'm interested from you how you translate energy and passion into real change. Oh, I, I think that's a wonderful question, and I, I was so incredibly moved when I saw the photos this morning of the women in, in Terrier Square. It, it, it just, and, and hearing you talk about it just now, I was almost moved to tears again. And it sort of took me back to when I first got involved in social movements in the United States in the 1960s, first of all, with the Civil Rights Movement. And I think, to some extent, the same thing happened in Egypt that happened to me and it is that many women were involved in the in the Arab Spring many women were involved in Tahrir Square very early on in the in the movements to to uh, topple the, the the previous government in Egypt but then they got pushed out then they got pushed back and what I noticed here in, in the United States it, it, at the beginning of the Civil Rights Movement and what my big epiphany was was hey wait a minute the women are doing the work and guess what Women ought to have civil rights, too. And that's really what got me involved in the women's movement. And I did learn a few things about what creates a sustainable movement, and you're so right. It's important, you know, you start with the fear. Being ticked off is a very powerful motivator. But you also have to have something specific to aspire to, and that's the first thing. And so it's so you're saying basically the movement for integration and equality between blacks and whites is what involved a lot of women to begin with. But then they saw that they needed to fight for their own rights as well. Exactly. And it's almost, you know, freedom is kind of contagious. You bet. You see it happening all over the world. And, and, and you start out perhaps by doing something for another group that you feel sympathetic with. But then suddenly you realize, hey, wait a minute. I'm entitled to this same kind of freedom. And once that happens, once that wind gets under the sails, there is no, there is no moving back. It, it will continue moving forward, but it won't necessarily move forward 
easily. Yeah. And as we've already seen, there's already been violence. Uh, many women have already been uh, attacked. Um, it, so it, it's not going to be easy. I, I think that to sustain a social movement, I, I call this sister courage. And actually, in my book, No Excuses, I, I talk about how you can apply these movement-building principles to anything you want to do, whether it's in politics or the workplace or in your personal life. And the women in Egypt have, have done the, the first two. Number one, they have decided to be sisters to one another. They have reached out to one another. I, I know the report said that some of the women who were leaders thought there might be 300 or so show up. Well, Suddenly right. there are thousands, thousands and thousands. Isn't that marvelous? Oh, it made me feel so great. It's incredible. And so they've already reached out to their sisters. That's number one. Number two, you have to have the courage to put the issues out there. Well, they've clearly done that. Then the third thing you have to do is you have to have a systematic plan. You have to know what you want to go after. You have to know what your demands are. And you have to stay with it until you get what you want. Yeah. And so that's really, I think the answer to your question that you raised at the beginning is to have a sustainable movement. Yes. You have to have that systematic plan and stay with it, execute it. And, and, and you know, un, I think we to compare it to what's going on with Occupy Wild, Wall Street in the U.S. How do you do that? Tell me. Um, yeah, what, what, you know, they have also, they have the fear and anger also. Yes. You know, they, ha they have the, they've reached out to each other. They've put the issues out on the table, but what they don't yet have is a clear vision no. of what they want to accomplish. And they're losing the public attention because of it, in my view. Uh, I think that that's right, and particularly with the winter coming. Uh, yes. There will be just a few people who yes. will be able to stand yes. staying, staying out in the cold. Yes, in fact, they're starting an Occupy Darianne movement, and I had to laugh because Darianne has a median income of $227,000. <laughs> so, I mean, what are they going to occupy? Somebody's hedge fund? I mean, it's really funny, but anyway. Uh, but uh, Not but, a bad idea, yeah, Lisa. <laughs> not a bad idea. Well, you know, I think the Occupy uh, Wall Street movement uh, missed a great opportunity, frankly. Um, I think because of the one and two, they could have had some kind of the three that would have resonated with the vast middle class and instead they run the risk of being completely marginalized and thought of as a group of obstructionists to local businesses and anarchists and I think I think they're, they're, they, they missed but I want to go back to the women for a minute because sure. I really care uh, to see women progress now the women in the United States yes we had obstacles of traditionalism but we didn't have the obstacle of God making sure that women had to be in their place and Islamicism is a huge, Islam is a huge obstacle for those people who believe that there's only one version of it. Of course, there are progressive Muslims who don't believe that, but there are many that, that do. That is an obstacle that we didn't have in the United States. How do you see that obstacle being able to be overcome in Egypt? You know, we actually have had that obstacle in the United States. You think so? Absolutely. The, the root of the laws, the Comstock laws, in the, in the 1800s that outlawed information about birth control, those had their roots in religion. Those had their roots in a fundamentalist kind of, of Catholicism. But by the 1960s, but, but, that but, really... But, and, let, yeah, yeah, I'm no, sorry, Gloria. Go to, finish. To, go ahead. To, sure. Yeah, to continue that thread, if you look at where the opposition is even today to women's reproductive self-determination, it is generally coming from fundamentalist religions that are patriarchal, hierarchical and at the root of it is really it's really not about reproductive rights per se it's about the role of women in society and every fundamentalist religion frankly seems to have that kind of hierarchy the need for patriarchy the need to keep women in their place so i don't think we should be too uh, you know we shouldn't be so um, so so full of ourselves uh, as we look at the as, as we look as we look at the uh, muslim world um, it, we see it more clearly because it's it's a religion that you and I are a little less familiar with. Well, I also see the uniform. I guess it's, you know, I'm looking at the outward. I suppose you could argue that the uh, the pinafore and the skirt and the apron were also a uniform. In, in a sense. In a sense. <laughs> exactly. You could argue that. Exactly. Uh, but, but I guess I see the physical manifestations of this religion in terms of women being physically covered up. It makes me cry, Gloria. Because it's, they take away their speech when they take away their face, you know? You, yes. They cover their mouth. They cover their voices. What is more fundamentally repressive than covering someone's mouth? That's absolutely right. It, it keeps you, in effect, speechless. 
and yeah. uh, and that you know that is what it's all about. At, at, at its roots, that is what this is all about. And I, you know, I think that the women in Egypt and the fact that it's women in Egypt who are leading the way yeah. toward toward this kind of a movement bespeaks of the fact that Egypt has been, for the last few decades, one of the more moderate yes. countries yes, in the has. Middle East. Sure. And so there has been, you know, more of those women have had, they have tasted they have tasted more liberty. They have tasted what it's like to be able to to be human beings in this world. And they are not as covered up either as, as many women are in, in many of the other um, Arab countries. So those revolutions usually actually come from places where people have begun to see that there is there is a way of liberty, that there is a way of freedom, that there is a way of self-determination. And it will take in a humongous amount of courage. Huge, huge it, it bravery. so much huge. courage. Huge. That's, yeah. that's the word that I keep thinking of. The bravery of these women to be seen, to be part of a movement where when they get home, they don't know what they're going to get from their own brothers and fathers, and, and they don't know the repercussions on their daughters and their daughter's prospect for marriage. I have a very dear friend who is a member of the ultra-Hasidic sect, and she is a trap woman. You talk about the um, the similarities of fundamentalism. Well, I certainly see it in Judaism as well as Christianity and, and Islam. Exactly. And, 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 and this woman is trapped. She had six kids by the time she was 29 years old. She was one of 14 herself. And um, and she has very few choices that are available to her. And the bravery that it would take for her to break out of the lifestyle and the life that has been designated for her would mean a severing of all relationships with everyone else. But more than that, more than that, I talked with her many times about seeing if her daughters could be exposed to a different way of life. You know what she told me, Gloria? She told me the problem with that is that if even one daughter rebels, the other ones won't get married off. And she can't take the chance that her entire family will be considered a radical group and that their fates will be completely eliminated in that community. So none of them are allowed to even be exposed to even the nth, beginning nth of a modern life. And it's a shame, and, it's, and, it, and I cry for her, and I cry with her, but that's the way she sees it. She won't risk the futures of her children. These women in Egypt are risking more than you and I can ever know. Absolutely, absolutely. And, 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 and it's, not the, it's not the first time in history, and, and since you asked me about social movements in the U.S., you know, the women who were trying to get us all the right to vote experienced the same kind of yes. police brutality. Yes, they They did. were put in jail. They were, they, you know, they went on hunger strikes to make their point. They were forced fed. I, 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 you probably are also familiar with the, uh, with the market women in Liberia who brought about the revolution there. And they had, in a sense, no power. They had no political power. They had no money. They had nothing. But they were the people who operated the shops in, 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 the, in the market square. And so every day they went to the market square, they sat down, they wouldn't open their shops, there was no economic transaction going on, they refused to have sex with their husbands, and eventually uh, they eventually got what they wanted. They said they wanted peace, they wanted an end to the war, and they wanted the dictator to step down. And eventually he did. And now we have a woman president of Liberia who just won the Nobel Prize for peace. Exactly. So exactly. that's a good story. So well, it, it yeah. can happen, but, but you know, it has to really be at that flashpoint, and, and then there is the issue of persistence. Okay. Persistence, persistence, persistence. And that's where I think a lot of movements have a problem. It's hard to keep that momentum going. But it is. you know, if you have a great story and you have a great mission and you're, you're able to, to get your message out there into the media and you do the, you do the sister courage thing and always have your support system by reaching out to other people, it, it can happen, and, and it will happen. And I predict even, you know, it, it, things will start happening, and there will be some women who will leave those Hasidic sects, for example. And then they will give courage to others, and, and that's the way it happens. And that's the way it happens, I guess. Uh, Gloria Fell, thank you so much for being with us. If, if there is somebody who is listening right now who, because I know that you're active in so many different w women's movements around the world, who might want to lend their energy, their money, their passion to helping these women in Egypt, do you have a website or something that they can find out more about it? Oh, um, 
You know, I, I would say, well, the Women's Media Center, womensmediacenter.com, carries many stories, and at the end of those, they will have that information, as does Women's E! News, um, carries many stories of, of the women's movements around the world. Um, I, I would think I would start there, okay. and, um, and, and, and then you'll find different organizations that are there to help these women. Womensmediacenter.com, Women's E! News. Thank you so much, Gloria Felt. It's always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you, Lisa. Really. Thanks so much for having me. Fantastic.